Greetings and welcome to our Meeting Point podcast at a turning point in the Christian year. Very early on in the history of the Christian Church, some of the big celebrations and festivals were given fixed dates or periods of time, such as Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, and there were lots of other dates and days which became significant. So it came about that there was a sort of Christian year planner or calendar for everyone to follow each year. It clearly divided the year into two halves. There were the events and feast days through that period from Advent in November to the day of Pentecost, which we celebrated last week. Then for the next six months, the teaching plan for most Christian churches begins today, and it covers most of the beliefs and facts of our faith. This begins with Trinity Sunday, although how and why it does, we'll discover in this service. It's for you if you're not able to be in church today for whatever reason. It's also for you if you need a little comfort and encouragement in your faith, wherever you are. Here's the first of three great Trinity hymns, with a verse dedicated to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You won't find the word Trinity in the Bible, although there's a lot of threefoldness scattered through the New Testament and some triple hints in the Old as well. St Paul's second letter to the Corinthians ends with a clear reference to God in three aspects when he writes, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Against the background of Islam or the Old Testament faith, with their emphasis on the fact that God is one, there are some logical problems to face with God having three persons. I choose to take a more distant view of Trinity Sunday, so that if we've got a hope of understanding the Trinity, 
we'll just step back from it and rename it God Sunday. After all, if we've got six months of Christian teaching ahead of us, it's best to start with an understanding of God. So we hear a reading of selected verses from Isaiah chapter 40. With whom, then, will you compare God? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught, and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than he blows on them, and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one, and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Him, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, is always linked with seafarers and the dangers of storms in the oceans. The chorus at the end is a prayer for everyone in peril 
by being at sea. And if you check the words, it's another of those hymns that dedicates a single verse each to God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So if we can just accept that there is a threefold nature of God, without trying mind-bending definitions or trying to explain the inexplicable, we might find sense and purpose in our Bible reading from the prophet Isaiah. These Old Testament prophets had a tough task in their ministry, because people often decided they didn't really like the faith that had been revealed by God over the centuries, so they changed it to an easier version. Rather than worshipping the Creator God, who is vast, unseen and unknowable, the people wanted an image or an idol that they could see. After all, the neighbouring tribes had a religion that had shrines, altars and icons, and that seemed a much more sensible way of what we might call keeping God in a box. As the modern saying goes, we can either worship the God who made us, or the God that we have made. Isaiah the prophet uses sarcasm, or irony at the very least, to mock people who lovingly build their household idol. They'll spend hours cutting the timber, carving the wood, and then painting it and setting it in a corner to be worshipped. So Isaiah gives the people a series of challenges. With whom will you compare God? he asks. Because God is incomparable. He's so vast, all-knowing and all-powerful, there can be no other, nothing to compare. God is our creator. He made the world as it is, and more than the world, when we try and take in the scale of the universe, common sense tells us that a little wood, stone or metal image couldn't create anything, let alone all this. Now Isaiah's on a roll. He says, God didn't just make the world, he has responsibility over it. God has a plan for the world and its people. And if we want to argue with this aspect of God, we just need to remember that our human span of life flourishes and is quickly gone. We're not going to be here for long, and in the bigger scheme of things, we're going to be here no time at all. But God because he is God, knows every intricate detail of creation, he numbers the stars and arranges the beauty of the night sky and the world as well. The prophet's sermon, correcting humanity's small understanding, ends just as he began, with a challenging question. Do you not know? Have you not heard? God is all these things that our minds could never grasp. He isn't like us. God doesn't have an off day or get tired from his work. But there is a tiny positive note of hope at the very end of what Isaiah has to say. God's strength and power is available to us when we do get weary. God's power drives us on and gives us the strength to do incredible things in his name and for him. This is our God. So to our prayer. Holy God, faithful and unchanging, enlarge our minds with the knowledge of your truth, and draw us more deeply into the mystery of your love, that we may truly worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, be with us all, now and for evermore. Amen.